I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about some of our endeavours in trying to improve drug discovery for cell surface receptors, really important therapeutic protein targets. So before I get started today, I want to start by acknowledging the huge team of people involved in this work, led by Arthur, Elisa and Lauren at the Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, along with Patrick and Denise, and a very broad group of people working with this team at Monash. This also involved vital collaboration with Monash BDI in terms of Wendy Imlach's group, the University of Tokyo in Rado Danev's group, uh, the University of Kansas in the group of Yunglong Miao, and I consider myself very fortunate to have been able to work on these projects. Second, hopefully today I'll also be able to touch on some of the new and exciting work we're doing at the Flory Discovery Science team, uh, working alongside Daniel Scott, Ross Bathgate, and a really talented PhD student, Lisa Williams. And then finally, none of this work would be possible, of course, without uh, funding. And so just would like to acknowledge the NHMRC and the ARC, along with a variety of other funding bodies. Working with international partners from all around the world is a fantastic experience because I guess everyone does science from a slightly different perspective and different ways of tackling problems. Uh, so very grateful that um, my supervisors and mentors were able to establish those collaborations. Um, and really, in science, it's always a big team effort and everyone brings unique uh, skill sets to hopefully work towards solving a common goal or a common problem. And so without that collective of, of really talented people all across the globe, um, work like this that's multidisciplinary wouldn't be possible. So proteins are the machines of the body. They come in all shapes and sizes and perform a diverse range of functions, including antibodies, which protect our body by recognizing foreign pathogens, enzymes, which carry out thousands of chemical reactions within the cell, structural proteins that provide support to cells and allow our body to move, and transport and storage proteins, which bind and carry atoms and molecules within the cells and throughout the entire body. But the proteins I want to touch on today are a class of cell surface proteins. So our body is made up of trillions of cells and their ability to communicate with each other is vital. One really good example of this is the brain in which there are billions of neurons and where the precise control of this communication is vital for healthy functioning. One key way in which cells communicate is by the release and recognition of molecules. For example, the communication between a sending cell, such as a presynaptic neuron, and a receiving cell, such as a postsynaptic neuron, is made possible by these cell surface proteins. So the presynaptic neuron releases a neurotransmitter, which is then recognized by a receptor on the receiving cell when it binds to this protein target. Importantly, this type of communication exists throughout the entire human body. And what I want to touch on today is our efforts to unravel novel ways of targeting these important receptors to help drug discovery efforts. So cells are separated from each other and the environment by a membrane, a barrier that is composed of lipids. These cell surface receptors are embedded within this barrier and allow the cell to sense their external environment and translate it into an intracellular signal. So there are hundreds of these receptors and they recognize a variety of different molecules and ligands, including everything from neurotransmitters, hormones, and even photons of light. So upon binding a molecule, this receptor then is able to send an intracellular signaling event by coupling with an internal protein being a G protein. And this is where these receptors get their name, being G protein coupled receptors. So this communication allows for coordinated control of cells that underpins our complex physiology, involved in everything from vision, pain, the control of the CNS and immune system, metabolic and cardiovascular function, gut motility, amongst many others. But disruption of this normal cellular functioning leads to disease, and altered behavior of these receptors can contribute to this disease occurring, but therefore, they are also important targets for various drugs, enabling disease resolution to be achieved. So a ligand we talk about almost 
uh, interchangeably with a molecule. So a ligand more means uh, in our world something that we've designed to drug a particular receptor or a particular target. Um, in the same way that the native molecule like a neurotransmitter like dopamine or serotonin, whilst they're endogenous molecules, they're also ligands or things that act on those particular receptors or proteins that we care about. So these cell surface receptors, or GPCRs, are highly tractable drug targets, and they account for about a third of prescription FDA-approved medicines. Some of these I'm sure you'll be familiar with and include treatments for CNS disorders such as schizophrenia and depression, metabolic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma, hay fever, and even cancer. But only about a quarter of these receptors are currently uh, targeted by FDA-approved medicines, with the remaining three quarters either in trials or not currently being targeted. And much of this low-hanging fruit in terms of drug discovery has already been picked. Therefore, we need new ways to improve our drug discovery efforts at these really important therapeutic targets. In terms of all of those receptors that don't currently have FDA-approved medicines, it just really highlights the challenge in developing useful drugs for these things. So there's still a lot to be understood about how these receptors function, where they're expressed, and explicitly what kind of disease states or pathophysiology they're actually involved in. Um, and then the next challenge, obviously, from that is then designing something that's both selective, uh, has a therapeutic outcome, but doesn't have associated unwanted side effects. So it's, it's quite a long road to get to that final FDA-approved medicine. And we're still unraveling ways in which these receptors work, even at the most basic level. So traditionally, drug discovery at these cell surface receptors has focused on an orthosteric binding pocket. So this word orthosteric comes from the Greek meaning correct or right site. So this orthosteric site is the primary binding site on the receptor that is recognized by the endogenous or native molecule. So for example, on a dopamine receptor, this will be where dopamine binds. Now to date, GPCR drug discovery has really looked at two paradigms, either blocking the endogenous molecule and turning off the receptor in much the way you would turn off the light switch, or turning on this receptor and activating it by mimicking the endogenous molecule in the same way you turn on a life switch, with these being antagonists and agonists respectively. There are several significant drawbacks to this approach. One key challenge with this approach is specifically or exclusively dragging the particular receptor that you're interested in, because at this orthosteric binding pocket, it can be highly conserved amongst a variety of different receptors. One really good example of this are neurotransmitters like dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, serotonin, amongst others, which share this very similar chemical scaffold. And because they share this large degree of overlap in how these signaling molecules look, you can imagine that evolutionary, how they bind to their given or respective receptor is highly similar. So as a result, you can see on an evolutionary tree that our dopamine receptors in red, our serotonin receptors in blue, and our adrenaline noradrenaline receptors in green are all jumbled up amongst each other, other evolutionary. This makes it really hard to design specific drugs for this particular pocket within the receptor. And this is problematic because drugs hitting unintended receptors can cause unwanted and nasty side effects. So that's challenge one. Endogenous just means uh, something within the body and produced by the body. So for example, we, when we talk about endogenous uh, neurotransmitters, we're talking about molecules like dopamine and serotonin, amongst many others, adrenaline, that are found already within your brain and without the rest of your body. So. Uh, endogenous just meaning um, native to the body, I guess. Challenge two it is now appreciated that receptors are increasingly complex in terms of the diverse signaling that they are able to cause. So traditionally, these receptors were viewed simply as bimodal or on-off switches, but it's now appreciated that in reality, they are able to adopt multiple confirmations that are coupled to multiple different signaling outputs. And thus, this is a highly complex system. 
Even this schematic on the right is a vast simplification of the incredibly diverse signaling events that can occur upon activation of a receptor. So this means that in terms of drug discovery, there can be on-target side effects. So even when we can design a selective molecule that hits exclusively the receptor that we're interested in, there can be both beneficial outcomes from this action as well as side effect occurring signaling events. So today, what I wanna to touch on is how we can start to move away from these traditional approaches for drug discovery at this important group of receptors. So like I mentioned before, traditional targeting has really focused on turning off or turning on this receptor. But again, this can be problematic due to selectivity and also due to the fact that this is then gonna cause lots of different signaling events. One strategy I'll touch on tonight is this idea of modulation. So this is where we identify a separate drug pocket which can allow the receptor to act as a dimmer switch and as well as a way to achieve drugs with better selectivity. And so we get a reduced output and hopefully reduce the side effects associated. A second strategy I'll talk about is known as bias. So this is where we can think of our drug more like a prism in which we can design certain molecules that allow for beneficial signaling without the rest of this signaling occurring. Thus, we can selectively choose the type of light we want to let through. Then finally, what I want to touch on at the end is some of the new and exciting work we're doing at the Flory, which involves alternatives to small molecules and medicinal chemistry, and instead use this very unique immune system of camelids, such as alpacas, to make biologics that can engage these receptors in a drug-like way. So the first story I want to touch on is this idea of using receptor modulation and treating the receptor more like a dimmer switch. So chronic pain is a massive problem. If you're familiar with anyone suffering from it, I'm sure they'll readily tell you. And nearly a third of our health expenditure is focused on chronic pain. And really, there's not a lot of great treatments available for it, and this has led to an over-reliance in treating this using opioid analgesics. In turn, this over-reliance on opioid analgesics has given rise to an opioid crisis amongst much of the developed world. And in Australia, this accounts for 200 deaths per million between those aged 15 to 64. So really, there's an urgent need for non-opioid analgesics that are both safe and effective in treating this chronic pain. So the system we've turned to to try and start to tackle this issue is the adenosine system. So adenosine is a chemical found throughout the entire body and is important for cellular protection. And it has also been suggested to be really important for pain signaling. But drug discovery at these receptors has been somewhat tricky. So this is partly because there are four receptors that recognize adenosine and they contribute contrastingly to our, our ability to sense pain. So while the adenosine A1 receptor is antinociceptive or relieves pain, the other adenosine receptors can be pronociceptive or inducing pain. Thus, drug discovery has been hampered by our inability to design molecules that specifically interact with this adenosine A1 receptor over the other adenosine receptors. So thus, we turned our focus to this idea of using a different pocket away from the orthosteric site where the adenosine binds and then treating this more like a dimmer switch rather than an off-on switch. The main problem with the opioids is that you're, again, targeting that, that same orthosteric or conserved main binding site within the opioid receptor. And so with that comes all the potential side effects associated with uh, over-engaging the receptor, whereby uh, certain signaling pathways might be associated with side effects. In theory, it might be possible to design some kind of dimmer switch molecule that engages the opioid receptor and acts in a different way to current opioid analgesics, but that work really hasn't kind of got, got to the point of um, working through clinical trials. The big advantage of the adenosine A1 receptor system is you don't have uh, the addiction and the respiratory depression side effects that you get with opioid analgesics, 
Um, but like I mentioned, it's really hard to generate something that's selective and only engages that particular adenosine receptor that we care about. And that's hopefully where this dimmer switch idea comes in, uh, engaging a different binding pocket where we can get something that's exclusive for the adenosine A1 receptor, but also something that doesn't overactivate the receptor uh, but also doesn't underact, right? So getting that really precise, dialed in, appropriate amount of response that we care about. So it's become increasingly appreciated over the years that potentially all receptors possess these allosteric binding pockets. So this comes from the Greek meaning other site, uh, and these allosteric binding pockets are binding sites that are non-overlapping and spatially distinct from where the endogenous molecule binds. So we can design drugs that recognize this allosteric pocket, and then they may have the ability to alter the response and or the binding of the endogenous molecule. And the degree to which they do this is the extent to which we turn up or down this dimmer switch. So why are these pockets really attractive? So the first really attractive thing about these pockets is they're a way to design drugs that have better selectivity and can engage exclusively with the type of receptors you're interested in. So in this picture here, we have a representative receptor where regions of high similarity are colored blue and are thin, and regions of low similarity are red and are thickened. As you can see, the orthosteric pocket is highly conserved and very similar amongst this group of receptors. But these regions away from the orthosteric pocket are highly diverse, meaning these have a chance of being uh, very discrete and different pockets, which we can design better drugs for. So back to our tree diagram, we might be able to design compounds for the dopamine D1 and D5 receptors here in red that don't hit these other closely related receptors. The other big advantage of allosteric modulators is they can be designed to have either a weak or robust effect against the receptor, acting more like a dimmer switch rather than an off-on switch. And this can be really beneficial. So if we think about our agonist or turning on the receptor exclusively, too much signaling can ar arise in side effects. Conversely, if we have too little signaling, this can mean a lack of efficacy or no therapeutic outcome achieved. So really we want to hit this sweet spot or desired response. So Peter Scammell's group at Monash MedChem has designed some compounds that bind to this allosteric pocket within the adenosine A1 receptor and then they were characterized in terms of their ability to change this signaling event. So VCP171 was one of these original compounds, and whilst it was able to bind to a pocket, it had only relatively weak signaling events associated with it, and therefore probably not going to be efficacious. But an improved derivative, MIPS521, had a more robust response on this dimmer dial, and thus has the chance of being efficacious. Wendy Imlach's group was then able to look at how these compounds behaved in an animal model of nerve pain. So what she saw is that while VCP171 was not particularly effective at repairing their response to pre-injury levels, MIPS521 was much more robust in being able to rescue these rodents back to a pre-injury level of pain. And this is really promising. But to further make improvements to this molecule, MIPS521, it would be really useful to understand how these subtle changes are able to occur that make it better. And so really what we want to do, if we want to make further improvements and understand how this molecule works, is we'll understand where on the receptor it binds. So here is a computational depiction of all of the possible binding sites that MIPS521 might adopt on the adenosine A1 receptor, ranked from high in red to low in purple. As I'm sure you can probably see, there are a number of very disparate and diverse sites which it spits out as possible binding sites for this molecule. It was then suggested from further analysis that perhaps this compound bound to the top of the receptor just above where the orthosteric pocket is and adenosine binds. But still, this wasn't with any great confidence. What we'd really like to be able to do is get a 3D picture of this receptor bound to the MIPS521 molecule. And by getting this detailed 3D information about the receptor-drug interaction, hopefully we can then use this to rationally improve derivatives.
but I, this is really tricky. So to illustrate the difficulty in this, these proteins and small molecules are in the nanometer size range, much too small to use a light microscope or even recent iterations of electron microscopes. A light microscope might be able to look at cells, an electron microscope might be able to give us detailed information about individual cells. These techniques are still not amenable to these small proteins and small molecules. But recent advances in a technique called cryogenic electron microscopy have now made it possible to look at these small proteins and small molecules under a microscope. Indeed, in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Dubachet, Frank and Henderson for their pioneering efforts enabling the development of this methodology, such that it has gone from looking at proteins as blobs pre-2013 to now having detailed atomic information about these proteins and other biologically relevant molecules such as drugs. So this is a really powerful technique and one that we look to employ for our receptor and molecule. Traditionally for GPCR and receptor structure determination, the real kind of pioneering efforts were done with X-ray crystallography. But uh, what's really happened in the last five years and moving forward is this cryogenic electron microscopy has seen a revolution in the, the numbers and ways in which we can get receptor structures. So this is now starting to catch up to what X-ray crystallography was for these protein, proteins and becoming uh, a, a very mainstream way of getting 3D information about the receptors and molecules that we care about. So just to briefly run you through how we do this, the first thing required is to obtain a highly purified sample of only the components we're interested in. So we extract the receptor and the signaling partner from cells co-bound to our molecule of interest. These are then applied to grids and frozen in a thin layer of ice. And we can then image these grids using cryogenic electron microscopes. Following imaging, we then use a variety of computational techniques to reconstruct a 3D map of what our protein and molecule look like. And so as an example of this, I've replaced our protein with a rubber duck. So we have our rubber duck frozen in various orientations. We then get a population of two-dimensional views of the duck in different uh, orientations on that grid. We can then use these 2D views to be aligned to finally put out a 3D reconstruction of what our little rubber duck looks like. And in the same way we'd do this, we would obviously do this for our protein of interest. So we get 2D projections of thousands and thousands of images, of which there are hundreds and thousands of individual images of our protein, which are then aligned in two dimensions, following which we get a three-dimensional map. And using this three-dimensional map, we can build in the final model or structure of what our protein looks like alongside our molecule. So we were able to do this for the adenosine A1 receptor bound to a G protein and with both the molecule adenosine bound and the compound we cared about, MIPS521. So from this 3D map, we can then use this as a blueprint to build in our protein and molecules. So you can see in blue is our adenosine A1 receptor, in pink, green and purple is our G protein, in dark purple is adenosine. But then the critical thing for us was to figure out where MIPS521 was bound. So as I suggested before, we thought that it was bound at the top of the receptor above where adenosine binds. But instead, what we saw was this extra bit of map in this region of the receptor that is embedded in the lipids. Indeed, when we have a look at this extra bit of map that we managed to obtain, it fits MIPS521 perfectly. And thus, MIPS521 is binding to a really unexpected binding pocket that faces the lipids. And what I want to really highlight is that if we compare this binding pose to the tens of binding poses I showed earlier, this was ranked among the lowest of those predicted to occur. Thus, without this technique and this image, we wouldn't have any real good idea about where and how MIPS521 binds. So we can now take this detailed information and start to look at exactly how the molecule interacts with the receptor. So hopefully I've been able to show you how we've identified a novel drug pocket 
and how these structural details can now be used to rationally make improvements to this compound so that we can get even better allosteric drugs at this really important therapeutic target and how this wouldn't have been possible if we'd relied purely on computational techniques. So the next thing I want to talk to you today about is this biased agonism and how we've started to use it in aims of achieving safer cardioprotective therapeutics. So cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in Australia. It causes one in four deaths within the country and it costs the economy about $5 billion every year. And again, the adenosine A1 receptor is also implicated in cardiovascular function. The tricky thing, though, is that signalling by adenosine through the adenosine A1 receptor is associated with both cytoprotective signalling outcomes as well as bradycardia or slowed heart rate outcomes. So what would be great is if we could design a molecule which is able to dissect these two contrasting signalling events. So this is where this concept of biased agonism uh, arises. So while our endogenous molecule, such as adenosine, might signal equally through separate pathways, such as pathway one and two, in theory, it's possible to design molecules which recognise and signal only down particular pathways. For example, a molecule that only signals through pathway one or a molecule that signals only through pathway two. With the promise of these biased molecules, being that we could potentially design ligands which selectively engage with therapeutically relevant signalling outcomes while not signalling through those that mediate side effects. So Lauren and Arthur, along with Peter Scammels, have been trying to do this for the adenosine A1 receptor, and they came up with this molecule, VCP746. So again, while adenosine signals through downstream effectors that are coupled to both cytoprotection and a slowed heart rate, VCP746 seems to selectively engage with those events related to cytoprotection without this adverse event occurring. Frank Cho, Lauren May and Paul White were then able to look at this molecule in rodent models of heart attack. And what they saw was that compared to vehicle, both an agonist and this biased molecule, VCP746, were able to significantly reduce the amount of heart tissue damage occurring. But really excitingly, whilst this agonist, when administered, had this significant drop in heart rate or this bradycardia outcome, VCP746 didn't have any such significant effect. Thus, we've managed to get the therapeutic outcome potentially without these adverse events occurring. But ideally, what we'd want to be able to do is make even better derivatives or uh, alternatives of VCP746 that might be able to progress further along the drug discovery pipeline. So to do this, again, we want to understand how this molecule binds and where. So computational simulations from our collaborator, Ying Long, suggested that VCP746 bound within the orthosteric pocket, but then extended up towards the top of this loop at the receptor. But again, further data from our group wasn't particularly convincing of this mechanism imposed for this really special molecule. So what we wanted to do was take the approach we've taken for MIPS521 and solve a structure of this receptor bound to our molecule of interest. So what we're able to see is VCP746 binds to the same initial pocket that adenosine binds to, but also extends out underneath this loop in this rather peculiar pose that we haven't seen before. Indeed, when we compare the adenosine bound receptor in gray to our VCP746 bound receptor in blue, we also see that it locks the protein in a slightly different conformation around this region where 746 is poking through. So it seems that 746's novel action is somehow related to this extended part of the molecule, which is trapping this particular part of our protein. So these 3D pictures have been able to reveal how VCP746 adopts this trapped pose where it extends out through the receptor or the protein. And this might explain the novel ways in which it is able to engage therapeutic outcomes over adverse events. Further, we can use this detailed information about its binding pose within the receptor 
to design improved drugs based on this original starting point, hopefully with the aim of one day having safer cardiovascular therapeutics. So the final thing I wanna to talk to you today about is the work we started to do at the Flory using these guys, alpacas, to come across alternative to small molecules for these important receptors. So most GPCR targeting agents that have been approved so far are small molecules. But over recent years, there's been a growing number of drugs in the clinic in phase one, two, and three trials that are non-small molecule alternatives. Things like peptides, proteins, and even antibodies. And these alternative modalities offer really different advantages to small molecules. One, they can often achieve better selectivity for the therapeutic target we care about, as well as different mechanisms of drug action. For example, we can make antibody protein drug conjugates for things like cancer. But to date, there's been only one FDA approved GPCR antibody as a therapeutic. This is because these are very challenging to produce and it's even harder to obtain antibodies that have drug-like action at these receptors. So one of the reasons these antibodies are hard to develop for receptors is that this region that recognises the protein is found between the heavy and the light chain on an antibody. So while this is really great for flat surfaces and for easily accessible proteins, it's not a great approach for getting it deep into binding pockets and crevices like those found on cell surface receptors. Alternatively, in the uh, late 1980s in Belgium, it was identified that all camelids, so camels, llamas, and alpacas, have a very unique immune system. So in addition to these regular antibodies, they also possess heavy chain only or single domain antibodies. Uniquely, the protein recognizing feature of these antibodies has a very long loop or a finger-like feature that's twice the length of that of in a regular antibody. And this long loop is really good at getting within binding crevices and pockets. And thus, this might be attractive for going after antibody therapeutics at these important receptors. Further, we can clip off this receptor recognizing portion of the antibody and get what is termed a, a nanobody, thus making them even more drug-like. So this is an illustrative example of a nanobody interacting with a cell surface receptor. Uh, and this is from a pharmaceutical company named Amgen. And what you can see is that long loop feature is able to extend right into the receptor engaging with the binding pocket. So we're quite interested in finding better ways to develop these nanobodies with a variety of different disease states in mind. So how do we go about doing this? So we've been using alpacas to do this, and I just wanna walk you through the workflow that we've only fairly recently started to undertake. So this involves generating a purified receptor, the receptor that you're particularly interested in for a therapy, and then immunizing alpacas with this receptor over the course of six weeks, with the aim being that these alpacas generate an immune response to this foreign receptor. So it's then a matter of isolating the genetic information from this immune response. And then we're developing novel methodologies to pull out interesting nanobodies or antibodies that recognize the therapeutic targets that we're interested in. With one day hopefully being able to generate nanobodies that are therapeutically useful for things like cancer, metabolic disease, amongst many other conditions. Importantly, the alpacas are really well looked after for six to 12 months of their life, helping us produce uh, hopefully a, a, an interesting antibody for our, our particular cell surface receptors we care about. They then uh, go off and live a very happy retired lifestyle. So hopefully tonight I've been able to show you how these cell surface receptors are implicated in a plethora of diseases, and many of which don't have good therapeutic options available. Further, hopefully I've been able to demonstrate how this multidisciplinary approach has been able to develop tool compounds which may be useful in understanding novel and different ways in which we can treat disease. With new drug discovery, options potentially becoming available for these difficult targets. And finally, how a detailed molecular understanding of drug and receptor interactions 
can help rationally improve and speed up drug discovery at these important therapeutic targets. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the people involved in this work and really thank the Royal Society of Victoria for giving me this fantastic opportunity to showcase some of the basic research which we're doing. The thing I'd really like people to take away from today is just the importance of doing fundamental basic research in understanding molecular mechanisms as well as drug action for these important receptors and the molecules we can create for them. Because hopefully a detailed understanding of how these things work will enable better drug discovery to occur. With better drug discovery, hopefully there are uh, then really effective but safe medicines available for some pretty awful diseases which currently have a, a large unmet need. Well, what a great pleasure this is. My first opportunity as president of the Royal Society of Victoria to fulfil one of our really important tasks, that is to acknowledge and award great science. So it's my great pleasure to present the first uh, award in biomedical and health sciences the Philip, to, in the uh, Philip Law Postdoctoral Award to Christopher Draper Joyce. Thanks, Rob. Well done. Congratulations. Very much appreciated and humbled to have been awarded this, and hopefully this is uh, just the start of things to come. A whole career ahead of you. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs>